Today in the newscast, we've got an exclusive YouTube bonus clip from my interview with incoming Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. What will he do to strengthen Israel's control over its ancient and ancestral capital, Jerusalem, and why he never thought he'd be Prime Minister even as he's set to begin his third term at the helm. That's next. Hey folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to the Watchman Newscast. We want to get right into it today with an exclusive bonus clip strictly for our YouTube audience from my interview with incoming Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Bibi Netanyahu. Now, if you want to watch my entire interview with Bibi, which airs on the Watchman Show on TBN this week, it is also available right here on our YouTube channel. Just go to the Israel News category and you will find it there. This will be Netanyahu's third term as Israel's leader. He's expected to be sworn in early in January and he is the Jewish state's longest serving prime minister with 15 years at the helm overall so far. During our interview, we discussed a wide range of topics from his brand new best-selling book, Bibi, My Story, from Iran to the Abraham Accords, from Obama to Trump, from Jerusalem to Israel's destiny, and the inside story of his time as Israel's prime minister and his incredible life journey. Again, the clip you're about to see is exclusively for our YouTube viewers, but the full interview is also posted here on the channel, as I mentioned, so you will want to check that out. Hey, and be sure to subscribe to the Watchman News channel right here on YouTube and click the notification bell so you get an alert every time a new video is posted. Folks, by the way, BB My Story is a great read that I highly recommend. It gives you a window into BB the man and the influences that shaped him into one of the world's most influential leaders. In this YouTube bonus excerpt, he discusses what comes next for Jerusalem on his watch and why he never thought he'd be in this position. Take a look. We talked about you sounding the alarm really before many when it came to counterterrorism and the terror threat. The profound influence you had on the Reagan administration, Secretary of State George Shultz uh, devoured your, there was a conference in D.C. that you organized on the terror threat and devoured your writings. President Reagan was also devouring your writings about the terror threat and how to handle it. You mentioned moving on. You were Israel's UN ambassador, obviously. Then you became prime minister for the first time uh, in 1996. Did you always see that as your trajectory? As you said, you were a warrior in the unit. Did you see this as your trajectory entering politics eventually? Not at the time, no way. Uh, you gotta understand, even though my father was a great historian and obviously had uh, deep convictions, we didn't discuss partisan politics at home. We were definitely on the right side of the political spectrum, uh, sort of pragmatic right, if you want to call it that way, but not, uh, never partisan politics. So I had no, no intention to enter the wet bog of, uh, of politics <laughs> and to climb the greasy pole that uh, uh, British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli described climbing. I, I had no intention to do that. Uh, it, it happened really only after I got appointed as Israel's ambassador in the UN. And when I finished it, that's when I decided to enter politics. And when I decided to enter politics, it was, oh, what the hell, we'll give it a try, we'll see what happens. But once you're in there, uh, well, uh, it's only then. That, so I, I was actually in my, in my middle 30s when I began to think about that seriously, not before. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up, uh, you know, aspiring to be a, a politician, or for that matter, the prime minister of Israel. I had no idea that that would happen. A friend of Yoni's comes to me and he says, you remember the time you were talking to your brother about going to uh, becoming an officer in the unit or not? Well, he was talking to me, this friend says. And he said that one day you, and I was 18 or 19 at the time, mm -hmm. that you will be the prime minister of Israel. And I said, I don't believe it. He said, no, my wife heard it too. And he wrote me a letter to say that, uh, 50 years ago and more, my brother thought that I would be the Prime Minister of Israel. I have no idea why he would have thought that, and I certainly didn't think about that at the time at all. You're coming back, uh, you're leading this government, or leading the nation of Israel once again, leading a new government, I should say. You mentioned the three pillars of the incoming government, Mr. Prime Minister, the Iran threat, 
expanding the Abraham Accords and continuing to build Israel as an economic and high-tech powerhouse. And yet, some are asking, man, 15 years, Israel's longest-serving prime minister, the leftist media attacking him, attacking his family. Why come back? Why subject yourself to this again? What is your answer? Why are you coming back? Why did you feel the need to lead Israel once again in these tumultuous times that we are living right now? Well, it ain't for the salary. I hope you got that. Right? <laughs> it's a life of it's a, a mission, a mission to yeah. protect Israel. We still have these three outstanding goals, which I think I can contribute to. And more importantly, it's not what I think; it's what the voters think. And the voters, you know, it's I think I have a job to do. They think, and they've decided. Uh, by the way, it's more. It's actually somebody gave me a note the other day, and uh, they said, "Well, look, in a year's time, you're going to be the longest-serving." elected uh, leader of a democratic state in the last half century. But he said, but you already have achieved another milestone. And that milestone is the comeback kid. I said, well, you know, there have been other comeback kids. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, who lose an election and then come back. Uh, uh, Winston Churchill, he was prime minister, lost, came back as prime minister. He said, no, 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 you're the only guy, comeback kid, who came back twice from political death. And the last time that happened was three quarters of a century ago. So, you know, if the voters give me that much trust, I, I, I should earn it by carrying out the missions that I uh, put out that you just enumerated. Yeah, hey, the echoes in, in Churchill again, right? You and Winston Churchill were the only leaders to address a joint session of Congress three times. And who knows, you might beat that record. The UN even putting forth resolutions that seem to deny the Jewish claim to Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Could you talk about why Jerusalem, so important to you personally, of course, so important to the Jewish people historically, but what are you going to do or what are you looking to do to just solidify Jewish control uh, in a united Jerusalem, never to be divided again? Well, first of all, it's, there's no question that's what we'll do, but I'm talking to you now probably about 500 meters from, uh, from the Temple Mount. So Jerusalem has been our capital uh, for 3,000 years, ever since King David uh, proclaimed it as such. His son, King Solomon, built uh, the temple where the Temple Mount uh, is today. The temple doesn't stand there, but it, it stood there. What we have is the remnant, is what, what is called the Western Wall, is the rampart that uh, uh, contains this, uh, uh, really, the, the, the uh, I would say, the foundation of our, uh, uh, of our history and, our, and, in many ways, our faith. This is where... Uh, for uh, a thousand years and more, the Jewish people uh, uh, developed their faith, which uh, also gave universal principles to uh, mankind. Morality, the whole idea, man's obligations to his fellow man, the idea of a monotheistic, of a single God, unseen God. These are ideas that developed right here, <laughs> right where I'm sitting. Uh, and that's been our capital for the last 3,000 years. And it, it took a while. And it's actually something that uh, uh, should be credited to President Trump because he finally recognized what had been so obvious for so long. Uh, and I expect others to follow suit. But it's going to be a, a long haul because there's a, uh, an ideological straitjacket that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the elites, the foreign policy elites of uh, many countries still cling to. You see that in the distorted resolutions in the UN. But that's not going to change our commitment to our ancient homeland and our ancient capital. It's going to be united under Israel, uh, uh, remain united under Israel. And remember that Jerusalem has a long history. When it was controlled by the, uh, the Muslims, uh, the Jews and the Christians were uh, deprived of access to their holy places. When it was controlled by the Christians under the Crusades, the Muslims and the Jews were denied access to their holy places. The only time that all three great monotheistic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, have complete unfettered access to uh, their holy places and freedom of religion has been under Israel. That's the real truth. And we'll have to just say it to the rest of the world until they, until they get it. Thanks again to incoming Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Bibi Netanyahu for a great interview. Remember, you can watch the rest of our wide-ranging conversation here on the channel, and I also encourage you to pick up the new book, Bibi My Story, 
which Netanyahu wrote himself in longhand. You can pick it up at Amazon.com or wherever books are sold, and it would be a great Christmas or Hanukkah gift. Again, it's a fascinating read. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Watchman Newscast. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, God bless you, and remember, never hold your peace. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to see more, make sure you go ahead and hit the like button, click subscribe, and tap the bell icon to turn on notifications for new Watchman Newscast episodes every weekday.